from Pirate Treaty. I'm going to share a bit about, well, mostly it was the journey that Pirate Treaty took to go from being essentially a three guys in a bedroom operation. It's not what you think. Uh, it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, I'm going to share, share with you our journey and touch a bit on internationalization because our company, you know, we started off from the very start knowing that the only way that we were going to make it was that if we uh, moved ourselves to be international because the 3D printer market, the consumer 3D printer market is very, very small and the only way that you're going to be able to get enough traction to get to mass production as we were planning to do is to, well, have enough volume. So without further ado, further, I'm going to continue with my uh, presentation. So what is 3D printing? I guess this is the first thing I should answer um, before I continue. 3D printing is this process that you essentially lay one material you know, in layers, one on top of the other, and you can create a complete object. Uh, for example, this bracelet can be 3D printed, created by a 3D printer. So what this technology does is that essentially it lets you, you know, have a mini factory on your desktop. You no longer have to spend like millions of dollars to build an entire factory to create something. You can now just buy a under $1,000 US dollar machine, put it in your home, and instantly you are a manufacturer and you can produce anything you want. So how it works is that, as I said, uh, produces things in layers, as you can see here in this uh, diagram. Material is put down in layers, and here's an example of something that we made. You can see if you look at this picture uh, that the object here is created in layers. So, what our product is, is a printer called the Buccaneer. It's very pirate related, so Buccaneer, pirate. And we built this machine to be affordable, intuitive, and relevant. Because 3D printing technology is actually not new, it sounds like magic that you can build something. You know, from your, your home. But the truth is, uh, it's been around since 1980 something. So it's been around for 30 years. It's just that it's very hard to use. It's a very, very, very expensive uh, process and equipment. And, you know, most people, even if you had a 3D printer, you couldn't do anything with it because to use a 3D printer, you have to use a 3D design software in order to produce a design that you can you know, make with your 3D printer. So we designed the marketing app, along with the software suite that comes with it to be affordable, intuitive, and relevant. And this is to fulfill our vision of putting a 3D printer into every home. And in uh, June this year, we went on Kickstarter. Kickstarter is, is, is this crowdfunding website on the USA. How it works is, let's say you know, someone suggests an awesome product, puts it, on, puts it on Kickstarter. Instead of having to produce the product, you get interest in the product first, and people around the world will put actual real money to back that product. And once you hit your target goal of a lot of money raised, then you can take that money and start producing the product and give it, giving it up to them. This is a completely new way of doing business, and, and it's really, really great for entrepreneurship and startups because now you no longer have to risk a lot of money. Uh, and if you look back in the 1980s, let's say I wanted to create a, a phone in the 1980s, I had no choice but to raise however hundred million dollars required to build a phone factory, produce that phone, and then hope that customers would buy the phone. So what crowdfunding does is that it makes the process the other way around. You sell the phone first, then you collect the money, then you produce it, which in my opinion is a much nicer way of doing things than having to raise hundred million dollars and not knowing whether the product will sell or not. So we raised about 1.438 million US dollars on Kickstarter, and uh, that has, you know, give, we've been able to sell uh, 3,300 3D printer units uh, to raise that amount, and this has given us a very large foothold in the market, which is really great because, you know, from a company that was, you know, a bunch of guys in a very cramped office, uh, suddenly, you know, we had traction. We are the, the probably you know, number top 10 3D printing players in the market now, just because of a one-month crowdfunding campaign. So Kickstarter is really, really awesome. Do check it out if you can. If you have an idea of a product that you want to put on the market there, do check out Kickstarter. So this is what we did uh, last month. And uh, what about how we started? 
I guess um, you might recognize these two guys that kind of famous. It's the two, the two Steve's of Apple, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak with a uh, prototype of the Apple One. And we kind of started kind of like that. Uh, there were two guys in a garage, and uh, we were two guys in a bedroom. It's because Singapore doesn't have uh, garages, you know, we all stay in condominiums up in the air, so no such thing as a garage. We were in a garage if we had, <laughs> but you know, you may do with what you want. Uh, and similar to that, we started with just a uh, very rickety wooden box and uh, hacker electronics. It's really, really hard to work with, and it's really, really nerdy work, but we love it. And so this is us, kind of like that picture, uh, huddled around one of our first prototypes. So that's essentially how we started. You, you can also do it yourselves. You know, if you have an idea of a product or you, you find something that you like to do, Steve Jobs and, and Steve Wozniak just happened to like to play with electronics and computers. It's not like they thought, I'm going to make you know 100 billion dollars by working on this bunch of junk and trying to sell it. Uh, similarly, we, we never thought that you know, we were going out there to build a billion dollar company from the start. We thought, wow, 3D printers are amazing. When we first started working, working with 3D printers and they created something, that feeling is, is, is just something else altogether. Because uh, the first thing we printed was, you know, it was a very simple plastic block. <laughs> it was a cube of, I call, I call it tofu because it was a white square cube. And the feeling when it came out, although it was a very simple cube, was amazing because just barely an hour ago, that cube did not exist. Out of just thin air, the cube was created you know, by this machine and a little bit of plastic, and it was just mind boggling. So we were working on three printers because we were passionate about it. It was a really, really cool technology to work on, and to be honest, we didn't really know that there was any prospects uh, of making money with, with 3D printing because it was a completely new industry back when we started in, in early 2012. Uh, so originally we were a service. As I said, uh, we were working with a rickety wooden machine like the Apple one. So that's our rickety wooden machine. It was a horrible machine because most of the time it didn't work. We spent 99% of our time repairing it and tinkering with it to get it to, to run. Uh, but you know, that's, that's what you get with new technology. So originally we were a service. So what we, were, what we did was we asked our friends, hey guys, do you need help with uh, prototyping? Do you want to create a model out of plastic? Do you have a design that you want to, to build? So we offered this service to our friends and you know, a few of them were in engineering school. Uh, is anyone here from uh, maybe mechanical engineering or has an engineering background? Yeah, okay, <laughs> fair enough. Um, so, you know, in engineering courses, you generally have to build prototypes. So that's what our friends did. They came to us to build uh, prototypes for them. But as I said, the machine is extremely hard to use and very, very unreliable. So we spent most of our time actually repairing the machine instead of building anything. And um, somewhere along the way, I pulled in a professor of mine from the university to uh, have a look at our machine. The idea wasn't, you know, to pitch to him or to raise any funds out of him. I just wanted his business because he, teach, he taught a course that uh, had a lot of prototyping involved. But long story short, he joined us and uh, he introduced us to Leslie over there and we raised a lot of money like in this picture. Okay, I'm kidding. It wasn't that much money. It was that much money. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be doing something else altogether. I don't like spending it on something else. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> yeah, we raised money to kick uh, to to Red Dot because we had this uh, prototype that we showed them, the Rickety prototype. I think I showed you in the, in the previous picture. And you know, that, that's important. Well, this is a, it's a great idea. It's a you know, maybe not such a great idea, but we, we thought that there was merit to the idea, and the industry was growing. So we took this money and then we you know, pushed as hard as we could uh, with our development and marketing, which is how we got the Kickstarter. And that's pretty much how we ended up where we are. Uh, we raised the money, we built better prototypes, we got working on a, a Kickstarter campaign, we did a lot of marketing, and you know, now we have some level of global recognition. You can Google as P-I-R-A-T-E, 3D, Pirate 3D, and you show up on Google and you can read about our, our company and look at our campaign. Uh, so that's the team of uh, Pirates, and we are a bloodthirsty bunch. So, um, 
that's a little background on the company and our, and our history. I will now try to provide some value to you guys by you know, you know, talking about how, let's say, you have an idea yourself and you want to bring it out to the world. But it just seems so crazy that you, know, you may be just uh, a bunch of guys sitting around in maybe a garage or a bedroom or a living room or bathroom. I don't know where you're starting your startup in. But it seems almost crazy that starting from such a small uh, thing, you can you know, break, build it up and then bring it up to the world. So you know, hopefully little pointers that I'm going to give you here will help you along the journey. If you have a little idea, you can make it grow and really bring it out there. So uh, point number one, open source is awesome. Back in the 1980s, if you wanted to do anything, it was impossible to invent anything because you probably had to go to a company and, and license their patents so that you could use their technology. But not anymore because now there's a lot of open source technologies out there on the internet. And open source technologies will shave away a lot of your development time because you no longer have to build everything from scratch. You can just build upon what's already uh, available. I guess most of you guys here are from a IT background and uh, you know, things like Sun Microsystems is open source. Most servers run on this kind of open source things. Wikipedia is, is open source information. So because of all these things, it saves you a lot of development yourself. You can just build on what other people have already built before as long as you contribute back to the community. And what we feel, uh, an argument against open, using open source is that if, you, if you're using open source, how are you going to make sure that someone else doesn't come along and use the same technology and then beat you at your gate. And what we feel is that you know, it's not about the idea. The idea is not important. It's about how you execute the idea that's actually worth more. So what a startup is, is you know, the startup is not about ideas. The startup is about execution. And the best ideas are not the ones that you think about for, for you know, many, many days. It's, it's the ones that you do the best. The best ideas are implemented. So another point, uh, if you're starting out really small, is that I think as Julian mentioned, you have to be like a bunch of rebels. And part of our part of the rebel idea as well is that uh, you can create a lot of branding and culture around being the, the underdog, the small company. I mean, it helped a lot that our company was called Pirate 3D because it had the idea of you know we're pirates. It's going to be fun. We're going to go out there and swashbuckle and have an adventure. So. It helped us, to, helped us to attract a lot of people to our uh, crew because people saw what we were doing, they saw our name, they, they saw had a sense of, of you know what the company was about because we are we are pirates. We're not going to do things the normal way. We want to do things the pirate way. We want to you know, bring out this technology to the world. And we want to change the world, and we want to, to create something that's really awesome and really put that in the universe. So this this whole culture thing will actually attract people to work with you. Um, I think uh, Leslie pointed out very, very much earlier this morning that you know, if you're working in a startup, you're working longer hours for lesser pay, for less job security. And if you ask anyone, you know, why would you logically want to work in a startup? It, it seems like insanity. If you work in a bank, you can get paid a lot more, and you know that the bank will still be there next year. With a startup next year, you know, the startup could be bankrupt for all you know. Uh, but when you have a certain company culture and a certain branding, you know, people will come to you and they want to stick with you because you know, they feel that your company stands for something and it's actually there's, there's meaning behind your work. You're not just working for a boss who doesn't care. You're actually working to change the world. And when you have this sort of meaning behind your, your, your work and you really build this into your culture, that's how you can attract the best talent to your startup, even though you're paying them well, peanuts in comparison to big MNCs. So, uh, how we do our work though is that we are very, very flexible on the how for our employees. We tell them, you know, this is we want this thing to be built. How you do it is up to you. Because it's, the idea of, of it is that you're in a startup. It doesn't have to just apply to the founders of the startup. We believe that it's actually a company-wide thing. Everyone should have this feeling of autonomy, of, of freedom that they can do their projects in any way that they wish to as long as it gets done. So we are very flexible on how, but extremely firm on the what and the when. Uh, the third point is that diversity delivers. Uh, I'm not sure whether you guys have uh, been overseas, but things are really different. I come here to Myanmar and, and it's my first time here and 
I'm experiencing all different things, and I'm sure that you guys have very different viewpoints on things than, than I do. And you should actually embrace this. Our team at Pirate is very, very international. Our engineers are from China. We have a guy from Russia. We got a Frenchman who's a programmer. Uh, we almost hired a Portuguese company. And, you know, it's, and we have a, a British uh, electrical engineer. So if you walk into, into our Pirate's office, it looks like you're walking into the UN building because there's so many nations represented by a single company. And we found that this diversity actually helped us a lot because you have so much varied views on things and you know, everyone brings something new to the table that you wouldn't expect before. So different lines, different talents. And uh, people young and old. Uh, our, our team, the core team was actually a bunch of young guys. I'm 25, my co-founders are 26. But we found that we really like to hire you know, older guys because they have a lot of experience and they really know how to get things done. So we, we've been very lucky that we've been able to attract this kind of talent to our company. And uh, you know, we, you know, young guys, I feel, you know, are good with inspiration because you're, you're energetic, you're tireless, you can just go out there and work many, many nights on something crazy and insane and you wouldn't have got dented down by it. Uh, but all the guys are good with implementation because they've been out there, they've done it before, they know how to do it again. And this is what uh, I guess us young guys kind of lack, we lack the experience and the ability to you know, implement because we do not know how to do it. And so, yeah, get input from everybody. I'm going to touch on uh, going global. As I mentioned at the very start, you know, Pirate was you know, designed to be a global company right off the bat. We never thought that you know, we're just going to sell our 3D printers to Singapore. Because if we did, we only would have sold 100 printers according to our, our statistics. And 100 printers is way not enough to, to get to where we are. Our goal is really market penetration. So you, you might think that you know, you're a small startup. How do you think about going global? The world is such a big place. But no, I mean, it's not anymore. The world is shrinking. It's coming really, really small. So as I said, we are built international. And uh, this graph here shows the number of uh, 3D printers that have been sold over the last six years. In total, there were 70,000 3D printers sold. A completely new industry. There's no consumer-friendly device yet. And you know, such low market volumes, we, we realize that this is a huge opportunity. You can easily come in, grab a lot of market share, and then almost instantly, you'll be the dominant market player. We only sold 3,300 units, which is nothing because if you if you read the news about uh, Apple, Apple's iPhone 5 sold about 1.2 million units in the first day alone. 3,300 units is nothing compared to that. But 3,300 units is enough uh, to capture 4.7% of the entire global 3D printer market. And if you just stay in Singapore alone, it would have been impossible to even capture 100. At 100, we would have been like a tiny fraction of that 4.7%. And right now, the 3D printing market, the, the more of market share that you capture, the more likely you are to be able to establish a platform. Because it's a new market. People are still debating between Android and, and iOS uh, kind of thing. You know, if you can be iOS and tell everyone, you know, I'm the dominant player with iOS, you will win the platform more. And that is what we were aiming for. So, what you can do though is to tap on your local advantages. Um, I'm, you know, I've just been here for two days, so I can't say that I would know a lot about uh, what advantages we have in Myanmar. So let me talk a bit about what we have in Singapore. In uh, Singapore, there's low corporate taxes, and uh, you're able to get a lot of talent in. The, the bit of talent here is actually compared to uh, America, because you have affordable wage levels. Uh, there's less competition for talent. If you're in Silicon Valley, you would have to compete with Google and Facebook for employees, and you can't beat that because those guys are huge. And uh, there's fairly open immigration policies. Not super open, but fairly open. It's not impossible to get an employee in to work for you in Singapore. I can probably hire one of you guys quite easily and get you through immigration or without the hitch. If I was in an American firm and I tried to do that, wow, I don't know. Get a green card to the US is nearly impossible nowadays. Um, aside from that, Singapore used to be a manufacturing hub, so there's still a lot of manufacturing expertise around. And finally, there's a lot of infrastructure and safety. So those are the local advantages that we had. And we had one very, very glaring local weakness in Singapore, which was that the market was like that. One single P on the plate. You're not going to be able to feed yourself on that. So because Singapore is a little red dot and you just have a little green P there, uh, 
we knew that if we stayed in Singapore, we would not be able to, to you know, achieve any of our objectives because we needed a bigger market. So we realized that we had to go international and we built our branding and our entire company to be international from the ground up. Our marketing and branding is very, very international. It's not, it's not region specific. We just took a very general idea, you know, pirates and freedom. Have you guys watched uh, the movie Pirates of the Caribbean? Was it shown here? Yeah? Yes. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so, international movies are your pirates, and it brings it out to the world. Anyone can associate with you know, Captain Jack Sparrow and, and pirate ships and, and you know, pirate, pirate adventure. So, our branding was built with this idea of you know, being pirates from, from the ground up because it had an international appeal. And uh, the internet is really is your friend because what the internet has done is that it's made the you know, big world really, really, really small. And you know, anyone with a computer now can go out there and reach out to any corner of the world. Provided that you, know, you can gather attention to yourself, and uh, finally, of course, we, we use crowdfunding, which I talked about earlier, Kickstarter.com. So yeah, here we go. Internet culture. I, I think uh, Julian touched on this earlier. Is it me? Okay, not not this specifically, but um, internet culture now. You, it's. Uh, I mean, it used to be last time that you had to understand different countries because. If you went to, let's say, you want to market to Japan, you might make your ads more conservative. You want to market to America, you want to make your advertising more loud and, and crazy and gregarious. But um, there's actually something that's called an internet culture, and it's really, really real. Uh, what I found is that you know you can go around the world and, and you know, talk about certain things like internet memes or YouTube videos, and because these things are so international, people around the world have seen them or heard of them. And this has created a very, very global internet culture, such that all you have to do is understand how to market to the internet, and you can basically market to everyone. We, we never did any research uh, when we were marketing our 3D printer, whether how to market to, let's say, Germans, or how to market to, to British people, or how to market to Jamaicans. Well, use me to market to Jamaicans, but that's besides the point. Um, so we, we, did, we didn't do any of the research, because all we did was just focus on the internet culture itself. This is something like the 80 20 rule. 20% of your effort will get you 80% of the market. So have a cookie sense of humor. Don't be afraid to be a little fun and exciting, like what we did in this picture. There's explosions and stuff there. And people really like this picture. It went quite viral. They spread this picture a lot. And it got us a lot of uh, PR for our company. So, uh, you know, the world is just a little blue dot, ultimately. So. Now, the point here is, although you're starting small, don't be afraid to go global because the world truly is your oyster. Yeah. Um, that's almost the end, but uh, there's just one more bit here. And I'm going to talk a bit about the opportunities um, for our company. Um, I wanted to share with you guys some, uh, maybe some interesting insights and hopefully you know, we could work together on some things. So what Pirate offers is a development platform because for a 3D printer to work, besides just the material and the machine alone, you need the 3D design files. So what Pirate uh, also offers is you know, this 3D design library. And what we need for this library is content. We want to stock it up with either designs or design apps so that you know, people can, with a 3D printer can you know, design things. Uh, so that's what we'll be covered in the workshop tomorrow. And if you can't attend the workshop tomorrow, it's cool, because I understand it's like 5,000 chat or something like that. Uh, 50,000 chat, yeah. So you, know, you can just email us instead at contactapiratry.com and we'll be happy to talk to you guys about it. Uh, another thing is that, well, okay, I think I mean, I came here to poach some talent. <laughs> it's the uh, hard truth. Um, I've been talking to a bunch of you guys, I'm, I'm sure you heard me say about you know, how hard is it to find your development talent. Because you know, there's just a real global shortage of uh, good web development talent out there. But if you are able to do Java, or you can build websites really well, and you want to join the Black Fisky Pirates, because we are fun and we offer a run in our office, uh, do drop us an email at career at yeah, And uh, that brings us to the end of the presentation. Uh, I think, do I still have some time?
Yeah, uh, I'll open up the floor to Q&A now because I feel that you know, I may not know what you guys really want to know about. It's better you ask any questions. Is there anything anyone would like to ask? challenge tend to be how do you take it to the market. So Pirate 3D given their marketing to the world, their customer, so their opportunity for them to become a partner in terms of bringing the technology to you, teaching you what the world wants and ultimately taking your uh, apps and actually, uh, and actually take it to the market. So they are almost like a distribution channel as well. So this still under exploration is one of the things that Red Dot trying to work with our company to actually uh, work with creating some local entrepreneur here that we can cultivate. Yeah, so we can, uh, we can see to the end of the presentation. All right, awesome. Thanks for 